Good morning, and welcome to the Sunday worship service of the First Unitarian Church of Salt Lake City. I am so excited that you're with us this morning. I'm excited to welcome you here. If you're visiting with us for the first time today, please know that you are our honored guest. I'd love to invite you to visit our website, slcuu.org, or our social media channels to learn more about our congregation and how you can be a part of what we're doing here. I also want to extend a special welcome to our friends from the Unitarian Universalist Church of Ogden who are joining us again this morning. Welcome, First Church friends. I invite you to drop a word of welcome into the chat and say hello to our friends from Ogden. Thank you so much for Zooming in today. I invite you also to stay for our coffee hour after the worship service so we can chat and hear what's going on with you. Now, this is our last week of virtual only worship for the time being. We'll still have streaming services, but we will have in-person worship as well. We will have limited seating in the chapel for two services, nine and 11. Now, next week's service is going to be a special one and I'm so excited. We will have a new member ceremony for the first time in over two years. If you are new to our community and you would like to join our church officially, this will be a time when you can do that. If you have joined the church within the last 10 years, but you haven't gotten to sign the physical membership book, this will be your chance to be formally welcomed. Now we do wanna get a count of how many people will be signing the book next Sunday we're gonna reserve a ticket for you, so you don't have to do that. And we wanna make sure we have enough welcome gifts for all of you. So if you are a person who either became a member during the last two years and you weren't welcomed in a ceremony, or if you're joining the church for the very first time, please email me today. I know it's short notice, but please email me today and let me know so I can get you on the list, okay? To all our members and friends, our annual pledge campaign is now underway, and you should be receiving your pledge letter in the mail by the end of this week. Our church is also transitioning to a new software management system called Breeze, which will allow you to manage your own pledge, update your personal information, and so much more. We're really just getting started and just getting into all the possibilities that this software is gonna provide for us. Now, here's what I want you to know, really important. March 20th, that's one month from, to, from, no, it's a little more than a month from today, is Celebration Sunday. March 20th, Celebration Sunday. That's the day when we're going to announce how much money we raised in our pledge campaign. It's different from years past. So that means you have a really short window to get your pledge card in. March 6th is when we'd love to have them in. That'll give us a couple of weeks to poke the stragglers, and then we can make our big announcement on March 20th. Our stewardship volunteers will be reaching out to you if you haven't gotten it in by March 6th. So just go ahead and knock it out. As soon as it shows up in the mail, think about it this week. Then when you get your letter, you'll be ready to sign it and send it right back in. We really appreciate you taking care of it as quickly as you can so we can all celebrate together on March 20th. In today's worship, I'd like to welcome our Director of Religious Education, Amanda Esco, to share a reflection, to be followed by Rick Langer. Rick is a member of our congregation, an attorney by trade, and is serving on the task force invest investigating the recent alleged misappropriation of funds that we shared with you last week. Rick will be sharing a message about why he gives to this congregation. Thank you, Rick, for being with us today and sharing your thoughts. And now we begin our service with the lighting of the chalice, the flame that for Unitarian Universalists represents the warmth of community and the fire of commitment. Today, we light our chalice for Mrs. R. D. Seymour, and for Vera, for Leo, for George, and Sarah, and Jesse, and Jenny, for Anita, and Priscilla, 
for Barbara and Norman and Roy and Edward. For these, our ancestors who have been remembered and for all the others whose names have been recorded elsewhere or for those who have been forgotten. In 2002, the Unitarian Universalist Association president, Reverend William Sinkford, gave a sermon in Fort Worth, Texas, entitled, The Language of Reverence. In the sermon, he described his own personal spiritual journey and the language of Unitarian Universalist principles. Reverend Sinkford pointed out that the principles lack traditional religious language and at what cost. If, he supposed, we limit our spiritual language to ethical platitudes, can we experience the breadth and depth of spiritual life? To say that this was a controversial sermon is an understatement. Somehow the New York Times picked up on this and wrote an article about it, and then all of the Unitarian Universalists reading the Times then wrote Reverend Sinkford to give, them their, give him their opinions. They stretched the gauntlet from how dare you to thank you. I have always been fascinated with language. The philosophical idea that people are the arbiters of meaning is a rabbit hole of C.S. Lewis proportions. Why is a pulpit a pulpit? What would it be if we just called it a tall box? Does it change its function? How and when was the value put into the word pulpit? The same is true for our religious language. We assign meaning to different words. We get to choose how we interact with them. The power we give them. By refusing to explore religious language, we close ourselves off to even the possibility of the experience of this language. How can we experience the depth of our own spiritual lives without sitting in it? Exploring the idea of something sacred of hope, mercy, covenant, faith, calling, allows us to create our own meaning to these words. As parents, we are the ones creating the religious vocabulary for our children and youth. We are the ones exploring and introducing the religious language and the ideas behind them for our young people. If we stifle our own exploration due to our own trauma or discomfort, 
we limit the ability of our children to create their own meaning with these spiritual words. If we want to break the generational trauma around religious language in order for our children to create healthy relationships with it, we must start with ourselves. That's what's great about being Unitarian Universalist. Our third principle, acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our con congregations gives us this charge. I accept you and you accept me and together we will build not only a community together, but most importantly, we will work on our own spiritual growth. By being open to religious language, we are allowing ourselves the space we need to grow. In her book, Fluid in Faith, Jean Nuyar says, quote, engaging in conversation is an act of love. It is listening, hearing the cries of other hearts and offering the cries of our own in return. This is what we must do. We must find ways to have conversations and convey our faith as parents and a religious body without framing it as the ultimates of orthodoxy. We must learn to talk comfortably, confidently, joyfully about our shared religious meanings. May it be so. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is uh, Rick Langer, and uh, uh, my wife uh, Audrey and I are relative newcomers to First Unitarian. We moved uh, to Salt Lake City in 2017 from Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, we made the move here for two reasons. Uh, first, our children live here and our grandchildren live here. And second, I was suffering from a uh, genetic uh, disease that I inherited from my father, and our children were insisting that it was time for us to uh, retire and to, to move here. Now, over the years, Audrey and I had visited Utah many times and uh, are in love with the extraordinary beauty of this state, but the transition from Wisconsin to Utah was difficult for us. Um, Audrey and I met in Madison in 1965 when we were students at the university. We raised our children there. Uh, we have family there, many lifelong friends there, and we were active in the Unitarian Church there. So with all that as background, the move here was difficult for us, physically and emotionally. Um, we live in uh, Daybreak out on the south in South Jordan, and our neighbors are, are lovely people, but they are not of quite the same kindred spirit as we are. And I felt for a while like we were uh, strangers in a strange land living here. And then one Sunday, we discovered First Unitarian Church. And I, I remember it like it was yesterday. We started at 10 in the morning with meditation with Shirley Ray and her group. And then here in, uh, in the chapel with Tom giving a superb sermon on our environmental crisis. And th at noon, the coffee hour and the chance to meet others uh, for us, it was like flipping a switch. Uh, at last, we were uh, with uh, uh, challenging, interesting people who I felt like uh, were kindred spirits, that we had finally found a home. Now, some of you have been members here for a long time, and others like Audrey and me for a short time. But 
please do not take First Church for granted, regardless of how long you've been a member. This church didn't just happen. Over its life, you and your predecessors have supported it with your time and your talents and finances. And if it's important for you to continue this, to continue the ability to worship in a progressive, open-minded community and preserve it for the next generation, please support this church. Audrey and I will be supporting it in two ways. First, by making a, a, a pledge, and second, by including First Church in our estate planning as a beneficiary of our IRAs. At the end of the day, we feel deep gratitude, deep gratitude to all of you who have worked so hard to sustain this wonderful community and make it available to us. Namaste. Friends, the work of our congregation is supported entirely by its members, and we are so grateful for the support that you give it. In just a moment, you'll hear David's playing lovely music again, and you'll see that great slide on the, sh on the screen that shows you how you can give today. We encourage you to give from your heart, and thank you for everything you do for our church.
Before I was a minister, I was a member of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Birmingham, Alabama. I still am a member of that church. It is the, fir it is the church that first knew me as a Unitarian Universalist and loved me and ordained me. You know, our theme this month is calling, and in our tradition, only a local congregation can call a minister and ordain them. The UUA doesn't do it, a congregation does it. And the Birmingham congregation called me into ministry along with their sibling congregation in Tuscaloosa. They formed me, they provided me the space to learn about church leadership, they supported me through seminary in great and small ways, and they voted to ordain me. I owe them so much. When I was new in that church and I wanted to get involved and start being of service, I thought I'd join the worship team. I was good at public speaking and I loved theology and ritual, but at first, it meant that my job usually was to read the announcements. <laughs> Humble beginnings. <laughs> it meant that I had to get to church earlier than everyone else. I would turn on the lights in the sanctuary, prepare the pulpit, read through the order of service, and then touch base with everyone who was participating in worship that day. The minister or the guest speaker, the person telling the story for all ages, the person lighting the candles and the chalice. These were among my tasks for a typical Sunday morning. Most Sundays, the only other person there with me was an older fellow. He was about 90 years old, and he would arrive as soon as the doors were opened. Our sanctuary had chairs instead of pews, and each chair had a little rack underneath where the hymnals were stored. But we had many more chairs than we had hymnals, and so we usually had to share the hymnals. So this man came to church early every Sunday and walked up and down the rows, straightening the chairs out and spacing out the hymnals so everyone had access to one. No one had assigned him this task. He just did it because he saw something that needed doing and it was something that he could do. This act of service made an impression on me as a new member. I had long distrusted church because as most of you know, I was a refugee from fundamentalist Christianity and I still didn't fully trust church. The church of my upbringing had particular attitude toward callings, especially in regard to women. <laughs> and I was still smarting from that experience. I guess it will never go away completely. And I think I'd like to just kind of go off my script a little bit now and talk about callings a little, especially because Amanda lifted it up too, right? I heard, because I heard that there's a local tradition here that also has a peculiar attitude toward callings. Is that true? It's just what I heard. <laughs> and that you heretics had been hurt, some of you, by that attitude toward callings. So I just wanna say welcome. We're all heretics here. <laughs> Unitarian Universalism is a heretic tradition. And both of our parent traditions, Unitarianism and Universalism, were also heretic traditions going back hundreds of years. So you're in great company. Now let me remind you, the word heretic comes from a Greek word which means, I choose. We are the people who choose. We don't throw away religious language, instead, we choose for ourselves what it means. Now, every religious tradition in the world has its own particular definition of what calling means. Uh, I understand a couple of weeks ago, Reverend Ian preached about Dharma in the Bhagavad Gita. That's a particular definition of calling. 
Judaism, Islam, and the hundreds of different Christian traditions all have their own definitions of calling. So I wanna tell you what our heretic tradition tells us about calling. We don't know whether a calling comes from inside you or if it comes from God or if it just comes from you being in the world and interacting with people and seeing the injustice of the world or seeing the ways that you can help. We don't know where it comes from, but our tradition teaches that nobody can give it to you. You have to figure it out for yourself. It's not easy, but that's, that's where we are. <laughs> that's what Unitarian Universalists teach. So welcome to the Heretic Club. Back to the Birmingham church. <laughs> Let's get back to the story. I knew from the start that this church was different. First of all, it was obvious to me that the gifts of women and queer folk and people of color were not just okay, they were welcomed and celebrated. We had a woman minister when I came to that church and just that alone meant a lot to me back then. It seems like less of a deal now that I've actually been a woman minister for a few years. Um, but I remember with great fondness how much healing I got from that as a new member. More than that, this was a church that really belonged to all its people. There were teams doing social justice work, teaching children, gardening and composting in the church's backyard. We had regular church cleanup days where everyone came and pitched in from the oldest to the youngest, and then we all had fresh lemonade and cookies when we were done. We had a little farm stand out front in the summer where on Sunday mornings, people sold the excess from their gardens and donated the money to the church. Lay people were often in the pulpit, and we had guests from the community come and share their perspectives as well. And when something needed to be done, like redistributing the hymnals on Sunday so everyone could see one, someone would step up and say, I'll take care of it. This man was following his own call to service. So was I. Later on, I came to learn more about this volunteer. I wish I could say that I'd taken the time to talk to him on a Sunday and learn about his life, but although we usually did talk on Sunday, it was small talk most of the time. I learned the most about him at his memorial service. He had been a science professor at the university and he had been deeply involved in the civil rights movement in the 60s. I wish I could tell you his name, but the truth is I can't remember. <laughs> I have racked my brain trying to remember because I wanted to tell you this morning. I even reached out to a few friends back home and they do remember who I'm talking about, but they also can't remember his name. They just remember, as I do, the job he gave himself, the small and constant act of service from which we all benefited every Sunday. After he died, Someone else took up that job, having been inspired by him. Someone else is reading the announcements on Sunday, today. <laughs> and that church isn't perfect. They've got issues, they've had drama. <laughs> People have come and gone and they're struggling to keep things going during the pandemic. Same as every church, I reckon. The big question that they're facing is the same question we are all facing. What is church going to look like on the other side of all this? Now, I'm the type of person who loves history. I know, I'm a nerd. But <laughs> it means that often when I'm wondering what the future will look like, I look to the past. I try to imagine myself in the past, perhaps at a crucial moment, and. Imagine forward from that moment toward knowing nothing of what is to come. What would I do? And it just so happens that this church has survived a pandemic before. <laughs> I pulled out what's known around here as the white book. 
Some of you may have it, <laughs> which tells the story of our congregation from its founding in 1891 until 1966. And in the second decade of the 20th century, our church was on shaky ground indeed. In 1913, the record tells of a minister, John Malik, who served the Unitarian movement in Salt Lake City while it was under the oxygen tent. Before he came, our fortunes had fallen to their lowest ebb. The novelty of the movement had long since worn away. The eloquence and inspiration of the founders were no more. The practical Unitarian Center on 2nd East had taken on the appearance of seeing better days. On this discouraging scene came the courageous John Malik and his equally courageous and personable wife, Eleanor Malik. For five years, they carried on when attendance was oftentimes under 20 persons and it was difficult to fill the quota of the Board of Trustees. After expenses were belatedly paid, the minister took what was left, which was sometimes less than a living. With a heavy but uncomplaining heart, he accepted this on account and carried on. The story goes on to remind us of the scene. The silver boom had ended in 1907, and many of the founders of our church had moved back east or toward industry in California, taking their money with them. The, quote, lusty brawls and elegant balls of the 1890s were giving way to middle-class society, tending toward smugness and the status quo. Between 1910 and 1915, a number of university professors had resigned over their right to exercise free speech in the classroom. Then the war and the pandemic. Reverend Malik and Eleanor eventually moved back east in 1918, and who could blame them? The record continues. The church carried on for an interval without a minister, largely through the devotion of the women of the Alliance. The interval without a minister was of 13 months due to the influence, influenza epidemic and the exigencies of war. It's hard to think about this church falling on such hard times that they had to go 13 months without a minister. We can slow down just a moment to think about what a hard time that was. But in that pause, I want you to notice who kept the church going, the Alliance. The Unitarian Women's Alliance, who kept many churches going during all kinds of crises throughout our nation's history. In this book of 235 pages, 50 pages are given to remembering the Women's Alliance. And here we hear from Mrs. R.D. Seymour, the president of the Women's Alliance during that time, who wrote, we have worked together faithfully and harmoniously and have grown to love one another in our work. We should like to keep on working, but the odds seem all against us. Our minister cannot live on $900 a year, and things certainly look dark. We hate to give up. We love our church, and we want our children to have a church and grow up in a liberal faith. But results have been so small. Is it worthwhile? Might we, not turn, might we not better turn our attention to something else and let the Unitarian Church remain a memory? Though small in number and poor in purse, I think we all have, shall I say, the pioneer spirit. <laughs> we love to work. We love to fight if it is a good fight. At any rate, we will go on hoping and trusting for the best. Mrs. Seymour and the alliance she led held the church together by a thread. And in less than 10 years, the congregation in Salt Lake City 
which Reverend Mal Malik had found under the oxygen tent, had revived enough to build the church of their dreams, this grand old chapel on 13th East. We owe those women our gratitude and so much more because without them, where would we be? Would there be a Unitarian church in this place? And yet, can any of us name them? John Malick's name can be found in the annals of the American Unitarian Association. Maybe his wife can be found there too as a footnote, though in those days, a minister's wife was practically an assistant minister. And if we look at this record, we find the name of Mrs. Seymour, her given names, only initials. Most of the names of the women she worked with faithfully and harmoniously are not listed in this book. We may never know who they are. Not long after I got this job, I wandered the halls of the place one day just looking at the names of the plaques that were hanging around the building. My office is named for Vera, Dale, Vera Hale Dudley. I have no idea who she was. I haven't yet found a record of her, but she must have meant something to this congregation. The names on the other plaques, Leo Samuels, George Raybould, and Sarah Ann Poole, Jesse Greenhale, and Jenny Brown Kennedy, Anita Rowe, Priscilla Maiden, who made an impact on the high school group, we know that much, Barbara and Norman Tanner, Roy Port, who funded our organ, E. O. Howard, who donated the carved mahogany chairs that Reverend Ian and I sit in every week. For each one of these people, there are hundreds of others who taught Sunday school, who served as ushers or made coffee, who printed orders of service on the mimeograph <laughs> and folded them one by one. There are board members and committee members who served two or three years and did what they could and then released the results, trusting that those coming behind them would build on the work they could never hope to complete in so short a time. The real slow work of change in a church takes a long time and a strong vision so that each team called to the work can hand it over to others who share their vision and their calling. There are hundreds of such people who may have come to this church for five years or 50 years but won't be remembered except just as we are remembering them right now. They were called to this humble work of keeping our church going. No one had to give them this calling. They weren't motivated by a heavenly reward nor an eternal punishment. They were motivated by the conviction that a community depends not just on ministers, not just on leaders, but on the small things done faithfully and harmoniously, week in and week out. It reminds me of the words often attributed to Mother Teresa, that we are not called to do great things. We are called to do small things with great love. This pandemic will not last forever. Next week, we will be back in this chapel in person, welcoming another round of new members who will be discerning the ways that they are called to take up the vision of this community. Warm weather is on the way. Daylight savings begins in three weeks. Can you believe it? And I wouldn't be surprised to see cro crocuses and daffodils pretty soon. So many things that have been so hard to do will start to get a little easier. And community will start to feel like it's within reach again. We might need some grand gestures, but we definitely will need many, many small ones. What are you feeling called to do for your community? What small gift do you have to offer? Bring it, bring it and lay it on our common altar and may all the gifts we bring be cherished 
and received with gratitude. Amen. So many thanks to you, our musicians, Jan and Paul and David. Thank you. Beautiful music. Let us extinguish our chalice today with these words by Dorothy Day. People say, what is the, small, what is the sense of our small effort? They cannot see that we must lay one brick at a time, take one step at a time, a pebble cast into a pond, ripples, they spread in all directions. Each one of our thoughts, words, and deeds is like that. No one has a right to sit down and feel hopeless. There's too much work to do. <laughs> 